Welcome everybody. Um, today on this video we are going to talk about how to reference properly. Now this is a topic that a lot of students struggle with. It's something where it's a, a little detail but it's considered a very important detail by the people who are going to mark your assignments. So it's important that you know how to reference properly. The good news is referencing properly 90% of the time it's actually very simple. So I'm going to go through some slides and uh, hopefully help you to see exactly how you can reference properly without spending too much time figuring out how to learn everything that we do. So this is a common phrase or paragraph. This is a common paragraph that we see students uh, would write. When leading people, one of the most effective ways is through authoritative leadership. With this style, the leader will create a vision of where the group should be in the future and leave it up to the followers to decide how best to fulfill that vision. Now, many students would look at this and say, it's fine. I, uh, it's fine, right? This is indeed what authoritative leadership is. I've, re I've read about it, so I know what it is. My teachers talked about it. I feel very confident that I know what it is, so I must be correct. But this is wrong. This is not an acceptable way to write, especially at the university level. The question is, how do you know this? And how should the reader know that they can trust you? You are not an expert, generally, on, on this topic. And therefore, you need to reference the work of experts. So we do that by adding references, and that's what this is all about. How do we add references, and how do we add references correctly? Um, so what's the problem? What is the problem? The problem is that is actually going to lead to a charge of plagiarism. Why is it plagiarism? Well, because uh, other people have written about this. Uh, Daniel Goleman has written about this, about authoritative leadership, and most students study Goleman's work at university, so we as the teachers are we're pretty sure that students know that it's Goleman's work, and therefore the student is knowingly using Goldman's ideas and because there's no citation the student is basically saying it's it's my idea and that is not okay because now you're stealing Daniel Goldman's ideas and you're taking credit as if it were your own idea this is what plagiarism is and and it's considered uh, intellectual theft uh, theft of intellectual property it's a very serious charge in university and, and a lot of lectures uh, do take it very seriously. So, how do we do it correctly? Well, it's simple, right? So here, we simply add a reference. In this case, the only thing we've changed about the text is we've added a reference to Goleman. So, when we say this, we say when leading people, one of the most effective ways is through authoritative leadership. And then we go into describe what the leadership is. Now, when we describe that style, we're actually using Goldman's description. Not Goldman's exact words, but he is the one who, who described it. We're using his work, so we need to give him credit for that. And that's fine. That is the right way. That is what we should be doing. So, uh, we just need to cite. Now, how do we cite properly? This is why we cite. Uh, but how do we cite it depends a little bit on exactly what we are referencing. So, in this case, we are, let's say we want to cite a journal article. Now, journal articles are something that university students should become very, very good friends with. This is where research is done, they are peer-reviewed, they are generally considered to be very high-quality uh, references, high-quality sources, and, and we want to use those. So in this case, we have, uh, this is just a fictitious uh, journal article with an author named John Smith. The publisher you can see is the Journal of Management. The title of the article is How We Learn. And the date on the article is the 15th of January, 2001. So how do we cite that? Well, it's simple. So we have our sentence where we are paraphrasing Smith's work. And at the end, we write the family name of the author and the date. You'll notice we don't write John Smith. We don't write Smith, J. We don't write J. Smith. 
we just write, we just use the family name. That is what is normal. Now there are in some cases, for example in Vietnam, where uh, a lot of people have the same family name. And in that situation, we may use the full name. I do when I'm referencing Vietnamese authors in my own work. It would be the same in Korea, where, where a, a vast uh, amount of the population has the same family name. So uh, you'll see some, some inconsistency in a situation like that, but in general we do it this way. We have the family name and the date. And, and, and it, this is actually, it's just a pointer. It's an indicator so that people can go to your references page and actually find out exactly what it is. So the key thing here is we want it to be unique, but there is a standard and the standard is that we use the family name. Now, let's imagine we are citing a journal article that has two authors instead of one author. In this case, we have John Smith and Susie Jones, same article details. We're simply going to say Smith and Jones and the date. So we know that there are two authors. First author is Smith, second author is Jones. Do not say Jones and Smith. You need to get the authors in sequence. The, the, the ordering of the authors actually does make a difference to, to, to to authors, so please do get it correct. In this case, Smith is the first author, author, Jones is the second author, and since Smith is the first author and Jones is the second author, we write Smith and Jones and then comma, the date. Now, if we have a book, usually when we have a book, or, or even if we have a journal article, oftentimes we will know the page that what we are referencing comes from. So for example, let's say we are uh, reading a, a book from John Smith and the name of the book is the same name as before. Uh, the only difference is now we know that what we're citing is actually his work from page 215 in that book. So in that case we simply write Smith, comma 2001, comma P.215. So here we're saying Smith is the author, the date is 2001, and it is on specifically on page 215. Now, sometimes we don't know the page number, or maybe actually the idea is not from a specific page. Maybe it is the overall idea of the, of the book, or of a chapter, or of several pages, in which case we don't put the page number. But if it does connect to, to one page, or even two or three pages, then we put that, that page or that page range into our reference. And you will see citing a book is very, very similar to citing a journal. So again, if we have two authors, we would put Smith and Jones, and then the date, and then the page number. So you'll see that there's really not so much difference about the way we cite a book and the way we cite a journal article. And in fact, if we just look at the in-text citation, it, it's not really possible to tell if it's a book or a journal or article. We need to look at the reference page to, to be sure about that. Now, if we have many authors, if we have more than two authors, we tend to say uh, Smith, which is the name of the first author, Smith et al. Now, et al, it's not English, it's Latin, but it is the standard way of referring uh, it, to multiple authors in this case. It means and others. So in this case, we're saying Smith and others, and we, we don't include who the others are, especially because some sources actually, I've seen, I've seen academic journal articles that have seven or eight authors, and we don't want to have such a long citation that it distracts from our writing. So in this case we just say Smith and others in 2001 and, and people can look up the details on the references page. Now there is another type of uh, way to cite where we don't put the name of the author in the parentheses. It's something we call a verbal citation. Verbal means spoken. And so in this case we say uh, in his research Smith shows that despite claims that different people have different preferred learning styles, reading versus listening, everyone learns best visually. Now in this case you'll notice we don't put Smith in the parentheses because we've given him credit in, in the text. Now when we are reading aloud, we normally never read what's in the parentheses. 
So we would, in the earlier citations where we had Smith and Prentice, we wouldn't read their name. But in this case, it does. We do. We do read aloud because it's actually in the text. And because we do that, we don't need to put it in the parentheses. Uh, anybody who is marking your paper will understand very clearly that uh, this is from Smith and they can look it up in the reference page. Now, if we're citing a website, in this case we, we don't know the author, we don't have a name. Sometimes a, a page on a website will have the name of the author and sometimes it won't. There are many news sites that are like this. So in this case we don't know the name of the, of the human author, uh, the publisher, let's say the website name, is Business Times of the Pacific, uh, same title, How We Learn, and we don't know the date because they didn't date it either. So you'll see here that in the citation that we give credit to Business Times of the Pacific. And with that, we, we are saying that we consider the publisher to be the author, which is really what should happen if we don't know the name of the human author. There are some publishers who consider everything that comes from the publisher, and so we say that they are, that they are the author, and that's fine. Now, we don't know the date, then we put n dot d dot, and it's important that we have both dots. I know it may seem like a, a picky little detail, but the fact is there is the right way and there is the wrong way. And you need to think, what is the purpose of the dot? The dot means that letters have been taken out. So it's actually no and O, so the, the O has been taken out, so we put a dot after the N, and D is for date, and so we've taken out the A-T-E, and so we put a dot, so N dot D dot. Don't, if you just say N dot D and you don't put the final dot, it means no D and that doesn't make any sense at all. So you want to show that you do understand the, the rules of citation. Now, let's say we have a, a website and it's completely anonymous. It's a, a, a blog somewhere and it's on, on anybody's website, but we, we, we're pretty sure that, that the hosting company is not really the publisher, just like uh, Twitter, right? In, in Twitter or in Facebook, when people write posts, nobody would ever say that that is actually from Twitter. It's, it's from somebody, we just don't know who they are. So we don't know who the author is, we don't really know who the publisher is, we know the title is How We Learn, but we don't know the date. The first thing I would say is you need to stop and you need to think for a minute. Because if you don't know who wrote it, and you don't have any publisher standing behind it, what makes you think it's reliable enough to depend upon for your work? So. We do just use the name of the article in this case, and this is, this is the standard for Harvard referencing, but you really need to stop and you need to ask yourself, should I even be citing this? If I don't know who wrote it, then I just shouldn't include it, and then maybe you, you shouldn't. Now there's some cases where there may be a quote that fits into your story that you're trying to tell, uh, and that may be fine, but you need to stop and you need to think, do I really want to use anonymous sources? Now, how about when we're dealing with common knowledge? For example, everybody knows the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Everybody knows that Vietnam is in Asia. Everybody knows that people like money. The, there's nothing new here, right? And so we don't need to find citations. We don't need to cite the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's, it's common knowledge. Nobody is going to argue with you about that. And if somebody does argue with you about that, they're they're probably nitpicking some little point to some, to some level of detail that actually nobody cares. So we can just ignore that. But we need to be careful here. When we say people like money, yes, people like money because it allows us to have more of whatever it is that we want. But that's very different from saying money motivates people or money is a powerful motivator of employees. In that situation, you would need to cite that because not everybody agrees with that. In fact, there's, a, there's quite a bit of research on that topic that disagrees with that statement. And so we need to be careful. We need to know what is common knowledge and what is not common knowledge. Don't just assume that because you've always believed it to be true that everybody uh, believes that it is true. So, but common knowledge we don't need to, to cite. Now, there's another thing that is a, a indirect citation. An indirect citation is where, let's say you read a, a, a journal article by Smith that was published in 2008. In Smith's article, he references Goldman. He cites Goldman's work from 2000. 
you look and you try to find Goldman's work from 2000 and you can't. And so because you're unable to read Goldman's work, you're just going to take Smith's word for it. Now, don't be lazy. Actually go and read the work. That's the right way to do it. But if you can't, then you do what you see on the screen here, where we say Goldman, 2000, meaning that, that actually the, the attribution, the person who said this originally is Goldman, and he said it in 2000, but we learned about it in Smith in 2008. And so then somebody can look up in the, the references page and they can look up Smith's uh, entry and they can see all of the details. And they can go and they can read Smith's entry where Smith actually cited Goldman. Now how about citing a lecture? So your teacher says something. Uh, and you want to cite that. First of all, avoid being lazy. As a university lecturer, I say things all the time, and of course I, I do try to always say things that are accurate and supported by research and things that I am I'm aware of are uh, published and that they are, are, are truth, and, and from my experience as well. Generally, in my experience, when students cite my lecture, it's because they're being lazy. So try not to do that. Try not just, just be lazy. You should actually go and, and find the source that I'm referring to, do the reading, do the research, read it, and cite that original source. Don't cite, don't cite your teacher uh, unless you absolutely have to. Now, another big question that students often ask is, should we cite definitions? Uh, we absolutely should. You should definitely cite definitions. And the reason is because different people have different definitions for the same thing. For example, if we have uh, the word team, right? What is the definition of team? Uh, well, if you look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which is a very well-known dictionary, they would say it's a group of people who work together. But if you look at Katzenbach and Smith, who are famous academic researchers in the field of teamwork, they look at it differently. They would say it's a small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, a set of performance goals, and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. It's very detailed and it's very specific. And so you need to know which definition are you using when you are talking about whatever you are talking about. So yes, you definitely need to cite definitions. Uh, how do you cite data that you collect? So when you're doing research and you are collecting your own data, we call that primary data, uh, that's data you collect. In this case, if you wanted to cite something, for example, if you'd had an interview with a business leader and you want to reference what they said in your, in your text, which is, is, is a very common thing that, that researchers do. In this case, if you talk to somebody named Susie or someone you want to call Susie, you may not want to use their official names, but it should be somebody you can connect back in case somebody wants to verify your work. Uh, Susie said money was less important than being respected by her boss or coworkers. So that, we just put it here. You'll notice there's no parentheses. Uh, there's nothing going to be on your reference page because you're, re you're not referencing somebody else's literature. You are simply citing your own uh, data that you collected. Secondary data, which is where you're getting information from uh, literature, in that case you cite it like you would anything else, whether it's secondary data or a quote or a definition or, or anything like that is, is absolutely fine. Uh, if you have done earlier work and you've submitted it in school or, or otherwise, and then you're going to use something from your earlier work, you actually need to cite that too. There's a thing called self-plagiarism, where you're plagiarizing yourself. Uh, we expect you, in, in university, we expect you to do your own work for each uh, assignment. And it is important that you, you do that. If you really need to use something that you've used before, that's fine, but then you need to cite it as if you published it at the time that you submitted it. Now clearly, there'll be no publisher. Uh, you would simply wrote that it was submitted. Uh, but you need to make it very clear that what you're including in this current assignment actually comes from one of your previous assignments. This is so you don't run into the problem of plagiarism, which can be a very real problem. Now, the, the, there's a question about whether you should use quote marks or not. The question is, really comes down to this. Whose words are you using? If you're using the words of the original author, then you put them in quotes. If you are paraphrasing, then you don't use quotes. Generally, paraphrasing is always better. 
Paraphrasing is better because you're trying to rephrase slightly for your audience, trying to fit it into your story. Now, the other time when we use quotes is when we have idioms or some kind of special sayings, uh, some kind of special sayings, as we say. We, we tend to put those in quotes, maybe without any citation, because it's just a, a common, well-known quote, like the early bird catches the worm, something like that. Uh, now, footnotes, when you have a written report, is when you have some, some text on the bottom and some little uh, uh, superscript character indicating that people should read and look at the bottom. In this case, there are some referencing systems, not Harvard, there are some referencing systems that use footnotes for references. Harvard, which is generally what we use in university, especially in business school and university, we don't. You can use footnotes, but that's for extra details or extra explanation. Don't use footnotes for your citations. Whenever we see students who include some footnotes with citations and some references and citations, it almost always means that the student is simply copying and pasting from somebody else's work and that the student doesn't actually understand what they are supposed to be doing. Um, why should you not cite Wikipedia? Something that university students are told time and time again is don't cite Wikipedia. Why? Because anybody can edit it. And as long as anybody can edit it, then we can't really be sure that it is trustworthy. It doesn't mean you should ignore Wikipedia. You should use Wikipedia. It is a fantastic resource. But when you're reading something, you need to go down to the references section and find the original source. That is what you should be citing. And, and you should be reading it before you cite it. Don't just blindly cite it and don't do an indirect citation. Actually go and read it and then cite what you read based on what you read. Now, uh, another important point is what does an in-text citation cover? Here you will see that there are all of the, there's all of this text and it talks about uh, these different leadership styles. And you'll see that there is this uh, citation at the end from Goldman. They think, ah, oh, yes, I've cited everything. But actually, that one citation only covers the final sentence. It doesn't cover more than that. So actually, the, pr the first two sentences here, they're actually plagiarized. And it definitely can cause you to fail for plagiarism. So we need to understand uh, that it only covers the final sentence. So one way to cite multiple sentences is that you, you actually put the citation after every sentence. And that's not great, but you may think that I have no other choice because I, I need to cite his work. Well, then maybe your writing style should be changed up a little bit. Maybe it's not really a great writing style. Uh, another possibility is this, where we actually do what's called a block indent and we stick in italics everything that, that the author wrote, and then we put the citation outside of the block to make it very clear. Again, the goal, the, the problem with plagiarism is you haven't made it clear that you are not the author of this work. Now, in this case, you're calling out Goldman. You're saying that all of this is from Goldman, and that's fine. That's good. It's his work. You need to cite him. Uh, just don't depend too much on, on that. You need to have your own analysis as well. Uh, and of course, what should a reference uh, page look like? Uh, it, it should look like this. You know, you, the key thing is the reference page is that all of the, 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 the items are listed in the order, the alphabetical order of the author's name. So you'll see that D comes before G, which comes before T. So make sure that you, you always have that. If you have a website, then you always include the date that you accessed it because websites do change. Um, if you're gonna do a lot of citing, if you're gonna do a lot of writing, and in university you are, you really probably wanna look into using a reference manager. Uh, I myself, I use Zotero. It is a free and open source software that runs on uh, Linux, Mac, Windows, etc. cetera. The, there's a, a paid option, which is EndNote, which is also very much liked by many people. Uh, but if you don't want to use either of those, you can always use Word's built-in reference management system. Now, in this case, you simply go to the References tab, you go to Insert Citation, and then you, you add your citation, you add your reference. You can add the, the type of source and the author and all of this. You want to make sure that you add the details correctly. Make sure that you put in the, the last name or the family name of the author and the first name of the author correctly so that Word can follow all of the rules. Um, and then when you want to do your works cited page, you just go to your bibliography, you generate your bibliography from Word, and it does all of the work for you. And you, you don't need to worry about the details of how to keep track of everything if you use the tools that automate that, that, that work for you. Um, if you want to find out more about this information, 
go online and do research. If you're a university student, you're expected to be able to learn on your own. Uh, there's lots and lots of written books about how to reference in all of the different systems, APA, Harvard, and all of the other referencing systems. So read about it, read about it more. That's it, thank you very much. I hope everybody has enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, please leave me a comment. Bye.